February. So I don't know. I mean, just assuming it doesn't that's happen, like the equivalent it of our August. Pitch black. I mean, no. You can see a light, a bright light in sure. dusky conditions. I'm just wondering, sure. based on the next thing you're going to say, if maybe he wasn't seeing the sun. <laughs> like, okay, so here's here's what. Okay, I know what you're getting at. I have written down in my notes here that we're all looking at that maybe this guy had had too much to drink, and so I had checked lunar calendar, which showed me that the moon was at less than a quarter of a, a moon. So there was no way that it could have been the moon. You're getting at that maybe it was the sun, and he was in an altered state from mushrooms, exactly. watching the sun bounce around. That's a. The, I don't know that. That's a that's a good question. I didn't even think to, to look at when sunset was. Yeah. So I just did a quick Google. Paused. Yep. Huh. Look at that. We're, we do that occasionally. Not often, though, so stop asking. <laughs> um, 6.54 is when sunset was. So, yeah, was. okay, it could have been the moon or something. So it, would, it had to be a, a light. It couldn't have been the sun. Could have been a star. Uh, Jupiter. Could have, could have been a rocket Mars. launch. Could have been could a have lot been of an airplane. Things. Could have been all kinds of things. So, yeah. yeah. That is what this gentleman said he saw. That seems... Sorry, that's fine. Yeah. It just seems like early yeah, I, sunset I for I, whatever. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to move on to 1974. Again, the month and day I, are not listed. Uh, there's a farmer who's working in his fields, and he says that he heard a noise that evening while he was working, and the sound got louder and louder, and he described it like air escaping from a tire, that like kind of high s- pitch. S- no, it's the like... Ee- yeah, that kind of lovely noise. But that guy, this guy was working on a tractor, right? Yeah, he was. He, he was, was driving. He was a driving tractor. a tractor. But he heard it and he stopped, uh-huh. and he got off the tractor. But he stayed near it. And well, that he started walking away because he's trying to figure out where this noise was coming from, and he decided that it was coming from behind a boulder. He went over and looked behind the boulder, and that's when he says he saw a bright orange light floating just above the ground. Like close to him. Close to him. Well, he he tried to get near it, but he said he felt like there was pressure on him, similar to heat. You know, you feel pressure on your skin from heat, but there was no heat. (laughs) Every time people do this, I always just think we really are just big monkeys. He grabbed a stick, (laughs) and he tried to poke it with a stick, but he couldn't poke it with the stick. Well, he wasn't waving at it. Get back! Yeah. Get back! He said he was trying to poke it with the stick, but he could never get the stick to Mm. touch it or get Mm -hmm. close enough. It was kind of like it was magnetically being pushed away every time he went for it. I I probably would have actually tried to poke it with a stick myself. Yeah, I, I... I know. That, that seems we're like all, a reasonable thing to do, We're actually. big monkeys. We, we do it. I, <laughs> yeah. We're tool-using yeah. apes. Yeah. So at this point, after having tried to hit it with a stick, he said uh, that's the point that it started changing color. It turned to green. It then faded away, as did the sound, after which he said he smelled kind of a sickly sweet smell, which then also kind of quickly dissipated. Mm. Okay. Yeah, his story is one of the weird ones, but there's all well, kinds of weird ones all, like this. Uh, they all vary quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. You ready for the next one? Uh, not quite. I've got to do just give me just a second here. Hang on. Okay. 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 Good. So we're going to go to 1980. This is one of the ones that I told you is kind of a, an outlier as well when we were talking about getting close. They're all kind of outliers. Two men were driving from the town of. Baduri to Bulia when they saw a bright light on the side of the road. They pulled up next to it, at which point they said the light took off, sprayed their car with gravel, and they watched it disappear through the trees. After it was gone, they got out of the car, and they said that they saw a fine white powder on the ground, but nobody ever collected that to to figure out what it was. See, a fine white powder, like maybe cocaine. I uh, don't know if that's true or not. Know, maybe meth. I mean, I'm not sure here. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't think at that time, 1980, I don't think that would have been as much. But it is weird that this is, they say there's this powder. Well, this is the first recorded incident of, or of the light actually spraying somebody with gravel. I think maybe it was just somebody in a hot rod who just peeled out and just showered them with gravel. And I... Right. 
I'm not going to disagree with that, Joe. Yeah. I, I've just, I've got to tell the story no, as, no, no, as, cool. it's, no, as no. I find it. So, but I can't disagree with you on that. But yeah, yeah, the lights normally don't spray with gravel. No, no, that's not normally what my lamp does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're going to go to uh, our next one. This is on the 2nd of May, 1981. And the person in question is Detective Lyle Booth. Mr. Booth was camping outside a boulia near a dried up watering hole. Um, and just to kind of give a frame of reference for the light, the surrounding vegetation was short trees. So they would have been, you know, like 15, 20 feet high-ish. They weren't tall, tall forests. Probably even less than that. He, he said in the middle of the night, he saw a light that he first thought was a headlight. Uh, and it wasn't in, uh, until he realized that the direction he was looking wasn't actually the main road. So it couldn't have been headlights from the road. And he says the light, which he watched for a while, was about 1,500 to 2,000 meters away. And it moved in a straight line across the horizon. Uh, but it didn't, of course, get any farther away from him. And it was whitish in color. And then... After moving for a bit, it stopped and stayed in one place steadily for about half an hour, at which point he fell asleep. Yeah. He woke up, uh, I think he said he woke up like 1 o'clock in the morning. It was a couple hours later. He woke up, and he said that the light had moved. It had now made its way over to the campsite of another person who was in his party, uh, and that was maybe that... Uh, it was a woman. Her campsite was about a thousand meters away. Actually, I heard like six hundred meters away. Well, again, yeah. again, six hundred or a thousand. It, and, and it varies. She's, that's just one of the things I've wondered about in this story. There, he, she's in the same party, but she's she's like a thousand meters away. Privacy. Is that what it is? How many I, feet is that? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, a kilometer. I mean, you know, you can do a hundred feet. And that'd probably do it. Well, you know what? I've I've been camping and I've heard you snore, and sometimes I think six hundred meters might be what it takes. Well, okay, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, I have no idea why she was so far away. I really don't. But you know, his his story goes on. He said the light had dimmed; it had gotten more yellowish, and it was now about three to six feet off of the ground, and it lit up the ground below it, meaning that it was casting light in her camp Maybe rather it's, than yeah it's just it's, it actually is a little floating fireball something yeah. like that yeah. yeah and he said he watched it for about five minutes at which point it suddenly just dropped to the ground and it went out it dropped and, and disappeared and again kind of like with um was it booth or not no this is booth with uh Rhodes. I checked the lunar calendar, and the new moon was on the 6th of that month, which was four days afterwards, which means there wouldn't have been but the barest sliver of moon. So, again, this guy couldn't have been just mm -hmm. staring at the moon. Well, I would, I, you wouldn't say if it was six days after, it would be a crescent moon. It wouldn't be a... The but tiny, it wouldn't be much of a crescent moon. No, it wouldn't. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be a half moon or anything like that. No, but it would be a quarter moon, something like that. What's one that we're going to go through in terms of, of stories? Because we could really keep this up all night long. Oh, yeah. There's lots of stories of sightings out there. There are tons and tons. People were chased by lights. People chased the lights. People yep. shot at the lights. People were shot at by the lights. That's I not mean, true. Well, okay, not quite. That one didn't happen. But, no, it's yeah. it, it's been all kinds of colors. So it's been white, bluish, grayish, orangish, yellowish. It's steady. It's pulsed. It's moved towards people, away from people, parallel to the ground bouncing up and down it's been noisy it's been smelly it hasn't been smelly it's been quiet uh -huh. i mean there's just all these things yeah i think human imagination at least you know, it, i'm not saying all lights don't exist but human imagination has thrown a few things in here well and i think you know one of the things that i've i've noticed in the stories in the la the stories from the last 30 years that i think is a good example of what you're talking about things that have been added to it is that radio and electrical interference have been added Added. So suddenly it's the light showed up and my radio went crazy and my mm. car conked out. And I really feel like that is something that has made its way in from UFO stories. Yeah. You know, ufologists are going crazy over it because now, oh, well, it, it, that got added in. So it must be an alien thing. That's that's what it is. Mm, for sure. So it's it, it, it definitely has changed over time. I'm in total agreement with that. So with that, I guess it's time... To go into theories. Mushrooms. 
Mushrooms are not on the theory list, but thank you for adding <laughs> that one, Joe. Now that we've covered that. You're welcome. Um, the first theory is... I'm going to say the easiest to discredit, and that is that the lights are birds or insects. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, really? Come on. Seriously. Well, it, let me let me explain it. So this is this is what the theory says. Is it says that a, there are a swarm of bugs that have eaten a naturally bioluminescent plant or fungus of some kind, or are naturally bioluminescent themselves. Or a bird that has eaten a bunch of bioluminescent bugs, or a bird that might be bioluminescent, is what these people are seeing. Right, I know. And so none of these things actually exist, right? None of these things have ever been found. No, I, no that's yeah, absolutely I mean, the whole idea, right. The whole idea that a bird could ingest a bunch of, say, like, you know... Uh, glowing I mean, gnats or fireflies. Or yeah. fireflies, and, and then start glowing those itself is, like, ridiculous. Yeah, okay, yeah, but mean, that assumes that it's a natural occurrence, right? I mean, there's a TV show I used to watch where they engineered, like, chipmunks to be bioluminescent. Mm-hmm. They just, like, found the gene and switched it on. No, they have done oh, such things. Yeah. They've done those things, so but, yeah. we're assuming that this would be the natural... I mean, it's possible that Australian scientists near Min Min were... 200 around, years around, ago? Yeah, around... Yeah. Okay, I'm not explaining the 200 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Okay. But maybe as as recent as fifty years ago, well, maybe it, even as recent as a hundred years ago. Probably like, not. But it could be like time travel too. I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know. Belly and I did do a lot of research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scientists have traveled back in time with you know bio bioluminescent chipmunks to create these lights. Or birds. Or I mean, birds. it doesn't have to be chipmunks, right? It's just anything. I like the idea of chipmunks. Yeah, but I, I mean, like I guess chipmunks. that's just yeah. assuming, right? I, I'm not. I hate this theory too. I totally okay. agree. But I just feel like I have to pitch in for the fact that like scientists could have created a bioluminescent bird. Fine. They could have. And they, they could have escaped, and they, they were have. like, "I'm not going to tell anyone." Yeah, but yeah, but birds. Evil scientists. That's where birds their, are bad. Uh, this their is, this um, is a bad theory. secret layer yeah. is. Yeah. And that's yeah. how they protect it. Yeah, bioluminescent birds. Yeah, it's as much birds don't usually stick together in a tight little ball when they fly. Yeah. No insects neither. Yeah, birds are pretty bad at night anyway. Mm. So the next theory that we have is swamp gas, which is also known as ignis fatuus. This seems silly. Okay. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. It's it's. They say it like a hundred times in every Men in Black movie. Yeah. There swamp- are there are many swamps near this area, only hundreds and maybe thousands of miles away. That's- so swamp gas is an uh, is actually the common name for biogas, uh, which typically forms in a wetland environment. Uh, those gases are primarily methane with hydrogen and some carbon dioxide in them. Um, and they, it is truly, it does actually happen because there's all that organic material sure. under the water. Sure, methane and stuff. Yep, yeah, and, it, sure. and it rots. And then as the gas is released, it can create, there can be enough heat to cause a spontaneous ignition. If you've ever watched Princess Bride and you look at the fire swamp, you know, the, the, all of the explosions constantly that's the Hollywood amped up version of what swamp gas can do yeah okay and interestingly there's there's quite a few researchers researchers who have seen these fireballs and they seem to have been spontaneously combusting in these swamps uh, one thing that is noted is the fact that when, and these are researchers not necessarily today, but some of these are in the 1800s, they would try to approach the, the fire. So they would see this gas starting to ignite. And they would try to approach it and it would retreat from them. It's believed that the reason is, is that because these people are moving forward, they're causing an air current and that is pushing the fuel source, the gas forward as well, which is why mm-hmm. the fire seems to move away. So that, that's that's some older research on swamp gas. But, uh, you know, the thing about it is, is we're talking like people are saying that they're at a distance of, say, a thousand meters from this light, and they're moving towards it, and it's moving away from them. Yep, that so. that, that is in... It doesn't follow along with this. But yeah. one of the things you can think about, right, is that... Even so, they've estimated what they, how bright they think that light is, and how big they think that light is, and that they think it is that distance. Mm-hmm. But we know, like, there's there's such a thing as an optical illusion, right? So it may be a dimmer, smaller light than the brain is perceiving. Therefore, it may be much closer to that person than they are anticipating, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's reasonable mm-hmm. to assume. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
That's no, fair. that's that's absolutely true. That's fair, but although you're, you know, you, we do have two eyes, which gives us kind of like, you know, three D perception. Oh no, for sure. But, but, but it's yeah. also but dark, dark, and you're looking at a light. And, yeah, no, it's true. You know, if you're thinking it's much brighter, I've done this before. I've thought, oh. You know, that car behind me has a headlight out, and then suddenly it's like, no, that's a motorcycle right behind me. Oh, God. What am I doing? Oh, yeah. You know, or, you know, that happens a lot. You're laying in the dark, and you see uh, what looks like a light way yeah. far away, only to realize that it's actually something that's only a couple of feet away, but very, you know, very dim. It's just a, it's a perspective thing. Or sometimes it's just something that's, like, stuck to your glasses. But uh, Yeah, that's that, that yeah. could, for but, you, be it. Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but generally speaking, though, you're going to move around a little bit. You're going to just not... It's not just the the three inches or four inches between your eyes. You're going to actually be moving around side to side. You'll get a really good idea of the distance to this thing. Not always. Yeah, but uh, usually. But, but that's, you know, I, I yeah. understand where you're going, but that's that's not 100%, especially in a dark environment. Mm-hmm. Um, something about swamp gas that I did want to point out that I found that was really interesting is that there was a researcher in 2000. He was a British guy. Um, he suggested that, and by the way, the fun note is, this is after his failure for 20 years in a controlled environment to create swamp gas, uh, to create the, the fireballs, that the lights were uh, what's called cold flames. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard yeah. this before. Yeah, totally. It's uh, So I don't, I don't completely understand the science behind it, but it's that gases that are nearing their ignition point will put out some light and that may be what it is. So they're, it's warm enough that they should, they're almost going to ignite, but they don't actually, but they're creating then this luminescence. Uh-huh. Problem, of course, you know, for all of, for the entire swamp gas issue is the location, as Joe very, very wisely pointed out in the very beginning of this, which no is... swampy. It's not swampy. This is known as channel country, yeah. which if you look at it from the aerials, it is nothing but just fingers of rivers and creeks going up hills. It's all dry. It's it's in the outback. Mm. They I looked up the rainfall and they get on average 188 millimeters of rain a year, which is about seven and a half inches. Compare that to a place like, say, Western Oregon, where we get 200 inches a year. Uh-huh. That's yeah. five meters of water. Yeah. yeah. If you look at Southern California, they're at, they're kind of in a bad bad decade. They are averaging about 23 inches a year, which yeah, is they're 600 in like millimeters. Yeah, they're in like trout. Yeah. And this is, and yeah. they're getting way up and above. You actually have to go to a place here in the states, like Arizona, which is a desert, to get the same levels of. Uh, yeah. minimal rainfall. So there ain't no swamps in this area. No, the it, it is, there's not it. enough constant water to create the um, the the rot to then create the gas. It dries and, out. The gas would escape. It on top be of that, on top of that, it's like swamp gas. You know, it can rise up. It can it can self ignite, but you can't just chase a car or run away from a car. No, you know, not no. really. Absolutely not. Mm. So let's move on to our next one. Because we've obviously none of us are in love with swamp gas. No smelly theory that I it hope is. I'm not. We're gonna go to one that I know Devin will like. Yeah. Aliens. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. This is obviously actually. True. Unfortunately for this one, I don't think it's aliens. See, I actually like aliens for this one just because it ties together some of the inconsistencies, oh, for and sure. I find a lot of humor in it. I really, it's, I would love this to be a situation where there's a, a some race that has decided that the outback is the best place that they need to do their version of Mario Kart at night in their awesome glowing little spaceships. Well, I yeah. mean, it makes it's like a very. I mean, realistically, right? This is a country where there's a strong history of documentation versus, like, say, Africa, where it's all st- like a lot of it is still oral tradition, right? Oh, okay. Or like has been. I at see. Least I when see. They what were, you're like, getting that. So like, written. there's people who are like have this written history, right? It's white people, and like everybody loves to mess with white people. <laughs> right? oh, yeah. It's also like this great landing ground where it seems like if you were coming to Earth, you were like, there's kind of a smaller place that we can still land at that. It, we can be like self-contained at. It's, it's not it's heavily Australia. populated, we right? Can, like, we can like you know land without being observed. Yeah. But here's the thing. Here's why I don't like the aliens thing is because they send down these little drones or whatever to to observe and gather information, and yet they make the they make them glow hugely. I mean, wouldn't you want a stealthier little drone? Than okay, that? but maybe they don't have um, you know night vision technology. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean what? Meh? 
Like, it, you have literally no way of perceiving how different technologies in this universe have evolved. Okay. Let's be fair, right? But, but they don't even have to be carbon-based entities. But yeah, but seriously, why would their little drones or their little spacecraft glow? Maybe they perceive light a different way than we do. Mm. Okay, now, now that, that I will accept as a possible reason of why they glow. Mm. If they see on a different spectrum. Or they yeah. just create different... I mean, there are, yeah. there are life forms on Earth that are in a different spectrum than our human but, eyes can even perceive. So, like... Yeah, but if they're... The, let's let's presume these, these are advanced, uh, you know, fairly smart aliens. So, they know, they understand the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And they recognize that if they're down here to observe us stealthily, they will know that... Uh, they shouldn't be emitting in the visible light range. They would know that. They so should, think, but they also might be I'm, like humans and so self-important where they're like, they won't notice. Could be an accident. <laughs> Somebody left These the lights on. These guys are yeah. dumb, but it also could be just, you know, like, we think we are so smart as humans that, like, aliens would be smart, but if we, you know, if there were a race that were smarter than us, they might be like, oh, these guys are freaking idiots we're just gonna screw with them like well we're gonna screw with them that's my favorite theory right is that like aliens just messing with you right but also it could be like but they won't notice uh-huh they, <laughs> they won't notice it's sort of sort of kind of see that and in, in, in the sense that you know they would this dumb bureaucratic mindset mentality you know maybe i guess but it just seems to me like at least one alien scientist would have said hey you know, they might perceive electromagnetic radiation in this bandwidth, which we can't perceive. But maybe they can. So maybe we should like m not yeah, be admitting like, in that. Yeah, but like put that in. But and our... then, but no, no. What happened then was he was taken before a special committee, <laughs> and and accused of crimes against the state right. and executed. Yeah. So, maybe so that's I what think happened. like my uh -huh. argument against that is like put that in our terms, right? Think if like. We discovered aliens, and like one scientist at NASA was like, but wait, they might perceive sound in this way, so we have to make our spaceships that are going to go investigate this silent. Obviously, everyone would be like, no, that's too expensive. We're not doing that. And also, they don't perceive sound. There's no way they perceive sound like that. That's insane. So we wouldn't do it, and then we would, like, you know, have a bunch of alien stories lore of people being like but you know, it's, it's weird and, you just hear this and, sound and you're right is that they may not i mean something that you hinted at earlier and that is that they may not perceive light in the same way it's like uh, there's that what is that crazy shrimp that yeah. can break um aquariums and they have figured out that they see a million more colors than we do yeah so it's it, they may not have ever figured it out but we've belabored that enough i don't know i like oh. we should talk about aliens probably soon but uh, well yeah for this i i, still, I don't i yeah. like the idea that it's aliens messing with people but i also don't think it's the strongest theory so this the, we, we're going to go to the next one which yeah, okay, is well. related which is that these lights are actually from some sort of dimensional rift in other words, there's something that is on another plane of existence that is trying to either is leaking through or trying to come through into our dimension, at which point it may or may not be an intentional set of lights. No. I mean, that's that's it's debated by a lot of people how this works. Not by me, because I don't really buy it, but... That's another theory that you see out there. Yeah. yeah, I like the idea of a dimensional rift, but, you know, I think that uh, you wouldn't just see lights coming through. You would see... You know, Dude, come on. You would on. see cars, <laughs> cars, houses, large rocks. Uh, you know, I mean, you'd see all kinds of crap coming through. You would think. but yeah. You would think, but not just lights. Okay. Well, let's move to the next theory after that, which is ball lightning. Uh, so I remember when I was a kid, I, this is, it's under, it's, believe, it's a thing, we know it's a thing now, but I still remember ball lightning being kind of a myth when I was a kid. And really, how, it's, it's always, uh, I, I thought ball lightning was always kind of proven to occur. No, they didn't really prove ball lightning was actually a true thing until I think about 20 or 30 years ago. Like, it, or no, no, it was in the, no, I, I'm lying. I'm making that data. It was in the mid-60s. Yeah. They had really, they knew, but they, we still don't know exactly how it happens. Like, yeah. It, yeah. It's probably electricity, like we've lightning. We've got to capture some of those balls and interrogate them. The problem is we have never been able to do that. I know. They're, they've been observed in nature, but that's it. Uh, but 
interestingly for this particular story for the Min Min Lights, there are some similar descriptions for mm. ball lightning as there are for the lights. So I'm, I'm just going to go through this list here um, and you'll see some of the similarities. There's some ones that are completely dissimilar, but I've pruned those out. I just want to make these little connections. Uh, so the similarities are moves erratically or slowly up and down or left and right. Uh, can hover in place, generally spherical, though sometimes pear-shaped with fuzzy edges, which I I feel like that sometimes. Um, The diameter is anywhere from 1 to 100 centimeters, which is a half an inch to 40 inches. They range in color uh, from red to orange and yellow. Uh, Yellow is the most common. They're rarely reported uh, creating any heat, though sometimes when they disappear, they can cause heat or a bit of an explosion. And they do tend to uh, have a smell associated with them, which is the smell of ozone. Um, Makes sense. But yeah, it totally makes yeah. sense. Now, of course, the problem with ball lightning is there's never any storms reported. I mean, it's yeah. good weather. Yeah, That's I mean, why I mean, people yeah. are out. Yeah, exactly. Ball lightning, it, there has to be a lightning storm, right? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Thunderstorm, usually. Yes. Not always, usually, but this would be a like statistically improbable mm-hmm. amount of ball lightning without storm. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah kind of. Yeah, there would have to be some, it's almost, it it would have to be there's some kind of catalyst to to cause it, which is actually something that's in a later theory. Okay. Next theory of the 17,000 theories that I have listed here. Yeah, for real. Is, um... Yeah, yeah, settle in. Uh, You might want to go to the bathroom right now. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, take a break. Put it on pause. So our next one is, Joe, how do you pronounce this? You've said this word. I I think it's Fata Morgana. Yeah, it's Fata Morgana. Thank you. Okay. So, Fata Morgana. There, I got it right once. Um, uh, so, there's a th- this theory is put out there by Professor Jack Pettigrew, who's observed the Min Min Lights many, many times. Um, and he's done some actually some really good research into it. And just so we know the... How do I say this word again? Fata Morgana. Thank you. Uh, that thing is a type of mirage or a light reflection. And it's typically seen on the horizon or uh, high up in the clouds sometimes. And it's usually at the horizon. So if anybody remembers last year, there was all that stuff going around the internet of that Chinese city in the clouds. I remember that. That, yeah. was, that was pretty awesome. That, that was really cool. That's, yeah, was. What, that's what this this phenomenon is. I got to say, if I looked up in the clouds and I saw a city up there, I would crap my pants. <laughs> I would I would be very very curious as to what was going on or yeah. what was about to come down. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So what what it's caused by is it's caused by a temperature inversion where cold dense air is trapped next to the ground under a layer of warmer air, and depending on they say the shape. So I'm guessing it's the mass or the density and how far of an area it covers uh, of that inversion. Light uh, near the ground can be refracted and sent through that cold. So light normally travels in a straight line. Mm -hmm. Or the curvature of the Earth, eventually it's going to go away, and the farther away you are over the horizon, you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. If this cold air is covering that area, the light can then travel through it, so the light actually bends and follows the curvature of the Earth because mm-hmm. that air is trapped next to it. Yeah, well, what, what it is, is like, you know, imagine your eyeglasses and, and they refract, and that's how they correct your vision. It's because the glass is a different density than the air around it. Mm-hmm. And same thing with that. I mean, hot air versus cold air, different density, you have that sharp layer, it's going to bend that light. Right. Just the way the lenses in your eyeglasses. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's how it works. You know, it's it's a very similar set of conditions to uh, what I still feel is my favorite theory for, for Skyquakes. Sky right. It's the, the same. S- it's the visual version of the audio version yes. of what you were saying for Skyquakes. Yep, yeah. exactly. Um, and, and normally this happens over water because that's where you get a good inversion be of air temperatures because the water temperature itself is going to help cause that but according to Pettigrew the channel country of the outback is also a really good yeah, place I mean for I it. would assume I would I would guess that the outback is kind of the opposite of a cool watery area right it's a dry hot, hot area. area so it may create an opposite inversion which 
I guess I don't know enough about science to say one way or the well, other. Well, the, the way if I inversion understand, is it's, like the it's, same either way. Well, it's because of the fact that it's channel country, so it's a, a lot of ravines and valleys, and so which are that cold air can get trapped in there. So that's that's how I understand. He so says we're talking this can a happen. small version of yeah, the, Morgana. S- the land is no, 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 it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, essentially, the land has been bombarded by sunlight all day. It's hot. Right. So it gets it's hot. hot. And then the atmosphere cools down mm-hmm. fairly rapidly, but the especially land, when there's no ozone. Yeah, and yeah, the land is still, re, you know, still warm. It's still re-radiating infrared and everything. It's still got warmth, but and it's, but and, and that's when that temperature inversion occurs. Mm-hmm. You know, and so. But it's the same either way, right? If it's hot on the bottom or cold on the bottom, the inversion uh, creates a sa- a similar effect. I think it's got to be. It's got to be cold on the bottom. No, no, it's mm-hmm. got to be cold on the top and warm on the bottom. Cold air is trapped next to the ground I under got... a layer of warmer air. Uh huh. So it is cold air on the bottom. So cold air close to the ground. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you're not going to have a layer like this high. It's going to be cold air that it's going to be warm, warm ground, cold air for God knows how, and then and then warm air above it. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Well, I mean, that's the yeah. way it's described. Is it's well, cold air trapped thing. next to the ground? The exact yeah. the exact amount we're belaboring. Yeah. The, the point is, is that this seems to be the place that it happens a lot. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I could see it in, in an arid environment, you know, in a dry, you know, you're not going to see it in a temperate environment like we have here mm-hmm. in Oregon, but in an arid environment or at sea or like down around, say, Antarctica, I could see it happening all the time. Yeah. Well, and, and here's what Pettigrew did. He and six observers, they, they parked a car and they left the headlights on and then they drove 10 kilometers away, which is six miles. And so that means that, of course, put some high ground between them and the car. Yeah. They then, uh, and they went out obviously at a time that they f- expected this to take place. So they knew the conditions were right mm. and they parked and they waited. And sure enough, in those conditions, they could see the headlights of the car that they had parked several miles away. Yeah. They actually, they put out a set of really awesome photos as well because that morning there was, the inversion was still there and a mountain range that was, or a plateau range that was over the horizon was projected up and you can see in the images as it's, as the, temperature is, uh, inversion is eliminated, it looks like that mountain range sinks back into the horizon. Right. So it's really cool. No, nah, that's cool. And then they went back to the the car they left there, and they found the battery had run flat. Oh, I'm they, sure. And they the, didn't bring jumper cables. Well, like I'm that. surprised the car was still there. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my, my main problem with with this theory, th- what he has done makes total sense to me. Mm-hmm. What it doesn't clarify or fix for me is that when we're driving cars around that are generating very, very bright lights, I get it. But 200 years ago, the brightest light at night was a campfire or the moon. So it's, and you would think that you would probably recognize some of this. So I don't think that they would be bright enough and it, it doesn't work for me. I, I have a problem well, with it being, you know, well, it's, it's only when we had this technology. Here's the deal is like, you know, when, when the Aborigines were occupying Australia, you lived in a fairly confined area that you ranged in. And at night, you look over, you look over that direction and you know, there's not a hillside up there that somebody can build a fire on right there's no there's no campfire on a hillside because that's just open flat range right but if this if this phenomenon is occurring if there's somebody over the horizon kind of up on the hillside that just built a, built themselves a nice big bright campfire and you're seeing it and you know that that cannot possibly be where you're looking at because there ain't no hillside there I could see why that would kind of give you the will. And I will add on to that that, yeah. like, I understand your whole, it would be, sp- like, you would be able to see, like, that's a fire. Looking at those images from China, for instance, right, you see, yeah, that kind of looks like a city. Oh, 